Okay, so uh, welcome to the first uh, meeting at Fields for the Geometric Structures Lab uh, for 2022. Um, uh, so this uh, this semester we're going to be doing uh, a bunch of bunch of material. Uh, it'll be separated for two sections. Some of it will happen here, and we will focus on geometric application. And, Spaces, flat connections, and related issues. Um, and then we also have some activity at the math department uh, at Toronto where uh, we'll talk about discrete geometry. And it kind of fits well with the program that's currently happening at Fields about discrete Lorentzian distances at Hatton right now. Anyway, the first talk um, is from uh, the new postdoc at Chris Cohen, that's the regular year. And he'll speak about his, his thesis project about irregular uh, isomonogram. Okay, thanks for being and uh, yeah, thank you for inviting. We're, we're going to interrupt you incessantly, so uh, get the book ready. Okay. All right, that's better. That's better actually. Uh, okay, thank you for inviting me. So today we'll speak about the um, well, the problem which was um, kind of part of my um, thesis, and I think I will speak a bit about some. Um, some new uh, directions and new thoughts about it. Uh, and mostly I will speak today about the irregular isomonodromic deformation. So, uh, well, if you are familiar with the isomonodromic deformation, it, it's mostly about the connections with irregular sing singularities, not just simple poles, but also poles of higher order. Yes, yeah, so before I will do any statement, let me just uh, take some time and explain the what was the isomonodromic problems, uh, what the connection with the Riemann Hilbert map and non abelian Hodge theory. So I will say some words. Uh, well, but let me be roughly some time. So let me start with the, in principle, the non uh, abelian. Hodge correspondence, uh, well, of Riemann Hilbert uh, map, well, in principle, monodromy. So we start with some uh, Riemann surface uh, of genus G uh, with some punctures on it. And um, for such surface, we always can. Uh, associate uh, three different spaces. The first one is uh, so-called uh, Betty moduli space. Uh, so, uh, and this space is the, um, um, you may think about such moduli space as a space of, uh, so you take some, you, you take your Riemann surface, you take some group G, Lie group G, and then you consider the space of, um, conjugacy classes of representations of the fundamental group of your Riemann surface with punctures in this group G. So since I'm speaking about the uh, conjugacy classes, so I take the pump from the fundamental group to G and I just quotient it by G. Well, um, another space which we can associate with this data, Lie group G and Riemann surface with the punctures is so-called the RAM moduli space. Um, and uh, this usually, uh, when we speak about the RAM moduli space, we usually refer to the space of flat connections. Uh, and uh, I um, usually I think it's better to think about the following uh, objects. So you consider uh, connections uh, on your Riemann surface which takes values in your Lie algebra and you do the uh, symplectic quotient, Marzen-Weinstein quotient with respect to the uh, 
gauge group. By the gauge group, I think about the group of, uh, well, local transfer. Well, you can consider the function from your Riemann surface to your group G, and you consider the local functions usually. And the third one, uh, which I don't want to talk about too much, is the uh, Dalbois moduli space, which is the moduli space of Higgs bundles. Um, and, well, in a sense, you may think about the uh, lambda connections, and then you send lambda to zero. So I don't want to speak about Dalbois uh, moduli space, but what non abelian Hodge theory says is that these three spaces are diffeomorphic. Um, and uh, well, I mean, okay, let's say that topologically these three spaces are the same, and uh, this non abelian Hodge uh, correspondence uh, is by uh, Simpson. Uh, and well, you may also think about this uh, non abelian Hodge correspondence. I think it's quite clearly uh, uh, explained in uh, papers by Philip Bolch that you have some. Uh, moduli space, uh, the mother moduli space, which is hyperkeller, and uh, these three moduli spaces, which are uh, mostly the same, are just uh, choose of a different complex structure on this mother uh, moduli space, which is hyperkeller. Okay, so and uh, what I will talk today about is that I will uh, specify myself to very uh, 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 I will restrict myself to the uh, Riemann surfaces of genus uh, zero. So I will consider the uh, Riemann sphere with some punctures. And instead of flat connections, I will uh, usually consider by the RAM moduli space, I will consider the holomorphic connections uh, in my case. So you may think about holomorphic connections quotient by, well, holomorphic gauges gauge group. So locally, it means that uh, my connection um, has the following form. So if I have, um, uh, let's say that I consider the uh, trivial bundle and uh, on that space, I consider the following connection. So it's just D plus uh, AI, well, actually something A of lambda, D lambda, where lambda is the uh, coordinate on my Riemann surface. Uh, well, and uh, the part of the non-abelian Hodge correspond correspondence, also known as a Riemann-Hilbert map, uh, is the map from the RAM moduli space to Betty moduli space, uh, which works like this. So you take a connection, holomorphic connection, and when you uh, think about holomorphic connection, you just think about the um, space of differential equations on your uh, Riemann sphere with some punctures. So uh, when I say something about punctures, it means that I allow my connection, this matrix, or this uh, Lie algebra value function to have holes at this point, okay, at this punctures. So, uh, well, uh, so what can you do if you have, for example, a logarithmic connection, so you have only simple holes, where your eyes are the punctures on my Riemann sphere and so on. Uh, then what you can do is to, uh, well, you can try to solve this equation and you will see that solution will be a uh, multi-valued function. And when you take some Cauchy data at some points, at some point lambda zero, and you prolongate your solution along the loop, which is, Topologically non trivial, so you cannot contract it because of the uh, puncture. Uh, then you will get that um, your solution will be just multiplied by monodromy matrix. Uh, another way to think about it uh, is just to, uh, well, this is quite simple because such connection is will be definitely a flat, right? Because it's holomorphic connection, and for flat connections, you have that. Uh, the holonomy is always non-trivial only around the non-trivial loops in your fundamental group. So in a sense, 
uh, this uh, map, if you, for example, associate your the RAM moduli space with the set of matrices, A1, well, I say matrices, but definitely uh, these letters are in the Lie algebra, but you may choose some representation. So you take your matrices uh, A1, A2, A3, N, and you send them to the corresponding monodromy matrices M1, M2, Mn. Okay, and uh, when I was speaking about this, um, oh, when I was speaking about this uh, spaces, uh, I also do quotient. So uh, in this situation, when you just consider these spaces as a set of matrices, uh, firstly, you uh, when you do this uh, symplectic quotient, the moment map will be just the sum of all uh, residues at at each point. So you should also uh, take into account the um, zero moment map condition uh, while on the beta space uh, on the beta moduli space the product of the monodromy matrices should be identity which is just also known as cyclic relation right so if you will go around all the points loop will be contractible uh, and also, you have some uh, freedom, so you can, uh, for example, you can diagonalize one of these matrices if it's semi-simple. Well, actually, you also consider the action of the group on both of the spaces, so you have some uh, uh, gauge freedom. So th this is, uh, roughly speaking, the explanation of the uh, Riemann-Hilbert map, and uh, in the case of the logarithmic singularities. Um, and uh, what are the isomonodromic deformations? So I think the question was. Yeah. So you have a modular space of. of, of both both of these data and there's a map between them which is the Riemann Hilbert map so any questions make sure that you understand this uh, basic so you can still understand the uh well uh so uh what you should do I, I I can tell you what 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 you should do uh you 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 solve the following uh set of differential equations uh um with some Cauchy data uh, at some base point lambda zero, okay? So psi of lambda zero, let it be, let me just take the case when this lambda zero is just uh, identity matrix. So when I say identity matrix, well, you may ask me like it's system of differential equations, why should I have matrix on the right hand side? I'm speaking about the fundamental solution, okay? Uh, and then, well, you can solve this, equation locally and then prolongate your solution along some point u1 right so you prolongate this solution and goes back for example you can do this numerically right and uh, then you will get uh, some uh, value of your solution of your fundamental solution uh, when you will uh, prolongate it along such loop it may be not identity well it will be not identity and the value you will obtain will be the monodromy matrix. Okay. If you are really interested in the uh, trying to find the numerical values of monodromy matrices, uh, well, I just advise you to look at the package by Mark Mezzaroba in Sage, uh, where you can calculate the monodromy matrices up to any with any precision. For a fixed differential equation, so you can play with this thing. Okay, this is. Now, of course, there's an equivalent relation, right? H, but never mind the the data coming connection to the linear space, pointing linear space, and then on the other hand, you get. 
the chief among them the points of the group, the product of the group into the end. And that could be an algebraic group. So both in those cases we have algebraic varieties on the top end of the model, but the mass of the algebraic variety to the algebraic variety is not an algebraic map. It's a highly transcendental amount when your map is very difficult to explain. It. It's it's not it's a, it's like a, a much more complicated version of the exponential. Yeah, it's locally works like an exponential, right? But globally, it's it's quite complicated. The only well, there are a few examples when you can uh, write this map explicitly. It's a uh, hypergeometric equations, for example, right? Uh, so usually these are the rigid equations, uh, if you know the Katz theory. Uh, but okay, so yeah, so that's what happens. And uh, so, uh, do you have any other questions regarding this? Okay, then I continue and let me try to um, explain you what are the isomonodromic deformations. So the question is uh, the following. So uh, I think it was uh, asked and solved by Schlesinger. So uh, how should uh, residues AI uh, depend on the location of poles UIs such, such that monodromy matrices MI uh, remains the same uh, when we write uh, the location of poles locally. So, well, for example, if you fix some differential equation, you fix this element in the algebra, let's say matrices. Here, right, you can compute monodromy matrices. They will depend, well, they, they, they will be some numerical invariants. And then you may say, okay, let me just uh, shift some uh, punctures like lo locally so they don't go around each other. So just small shifts. If you will not change these matrices, your monodromy will change. Why? Because the in a sense, intuitively, the distance between punctures will change, the transition matrix, the solution of your differential equation will change, global monodromy will change, right? And the question is, okay, may I ask these letters A to be the functions of U, such that when I write them, uh, monodromy matrices are the same. So uh, the answer to this question in the case of the simple poles was given by Schlesinger, by, by himself. Uh, and uh, what, what he found is that uh, actually uh, the uh, matrices AI should be solution, uh, should solve the following set of differential equations. So uh, if you differentiate matrix AI with, uh, uh, if you different, you take the following derivative where J is not I, then it should be the following equation. And if you differentiate AI with UI, so the same index, it should be the following equation. Um, so up to sign. These equations are the following set of already nonlinear differential equations for the matrices AI. Well, uh, and if you if you if you're lucky enough to find the solution of this uh, set of equations. Uh, you will get an isomonodromic deformation for your system. But, uh, well, Mark already told us that this map is transcendental and uh, this words. Uh, what I should say is that in, in, in simple non-rigid case, if you will take uh, SL2 connection over your Riemann sphere and you will take four punctures, uh, then this set of equation reduces to uh 
find the V6 equation, which is which was proven to be transcendental function. And in some cases, you can find some special solutions, but in general, it defines you um, uh, some transcendental function, quite nonlinear and quite complicated. Uh, and uh, why, why, why this fact is connected uh, with the fact that the Riemann Hilbert map itself is a quite complex transcendental. Uh, Yes, uh, so so up to conjugacy, uh, because uh, you can see that, uh, yes, yeah, 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 but if you will look at these equations, you will firstly see that this is actually the uh, um, first integral for this system of differential equations, because if you will take summation in the upper index here for example uh, here uh, then you will see that the right hand side just cancels right because uh, you will sum over i here and here you will switch to j for example and you have two uh, same sums with different signs okay maybe i'm well in principle also you can see that uh, the equations are of the lux form right because each matrix d a I over D U J is the commutator of A I with something, right? And it means that the eigenvalues of this matrix, if you consider matrices, are the constants of motion for this flow, right? So yeah, of course you need to reduce and yeah, uh, well, ask, uh, uh, answering to your question, up to conjugates. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 well, I, I mean, uh, I didn't prepare any questions for the audience, but uh, yeah, I mean, you should think that we obtain some differential equations, obviously written in non-reduced form, because as I already told you, you should also, well, you, you can try to uh, challenge it and see that it respects this uh, first integral, for example, right? Uh, well, actually, you may uh, you may you may think that uh, the level of this first integral is non-zero. It will mean that you have additional point at infinity, for example, right? Um, another thing, you, well, we already discussed it that. So, so, so in principle, you should do a reduction, and then you will finally get some differential equation which parameterize your connection such that when you move poles, monodromy remains the same. And what does it mean? It means that the following. So, imagine that I have such graph I have some I have my well this is a big abuse of notation but I will use it I have a Dara modular space so space of differential equations I have my space of uh, u1 un and here I have some complicated solution of my equation it might be uh, well non one to one function and so on it might be quite complicated right but since the um, monodromy matrices remains the same it means that when i uh, uh, use the riemann hilbert map and take these trajectories 
to the following graph. So I have on the bottom, I have my deformation parameters U1, UN. And here I have Betty moduli space. So monodromy matrices doesn't change. So it will be just a parallel flow, right? At least locally. Okay. So yes. And if this map is simple enough, it means that you can resolve this equation because uh, monodromy matrices are natural first integrals by definition for this system, right? But since the Riemann Hilbert map is highly transcendental, or in other case, if you see that you obtain some finally V equation, finally V6 equation, which you cannot solve, it means that transcendence is hidden not only in the solution of this equation, but also in the Riemann Hilbert map itself. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is. Um, and what I didn't tell you is that actually, when we consider connection, right, we also have an action of the Möbius group on our um, uh, puncture treatment sphere. And if you will uh, uh, consider such action, uh, you can see that it doesn't change the equation itself. So it means that Fuchsian equation transfer to Fuchsian equation when you perform such transforma uh, transformation. So Lambda equals to W minus, uh, well, A, W minus B, uh, C, W minus D, where A, B, C, D in PSL2. And it means that you may always fix three points at zero, one, and infinity. And the only deformation parameters uh, you have are the rest. So instead of considering the whole space of punctures here, right, you just consider the moduli space uh, or Riemann moduli space of uh, Riemann sphere with n points. And this space is just uh, what? It, it, it's just a Riemann sphere, it's just P1 without 0, 1, and infinity because I don't want my punctures to collide for a while uh, in power n minus three uh, minus diagonals. Okay, so this is a configuration space for the uh, n points on the Riemann sphere if you quotient it by the Möbius transformation. And this is quite nice geometrical picture because now you understand that if you take any other Riemann uh, surface, uh, and you want to consider isomonodromic deformation, the natural deformation parameters are the moduli, uh, Riemann moduli space of your base curve. Okay. Yeah, and uh, so, uh, but the question is what happens when these um, uh, points collide together? If you consider Riemann moduli problems, we know that, for example, if you have four point sphere, you have only one compactification, delin part compactification, and so on. But when you uh, consider the, the RAM model space, you can uh, consider such limits that your Fuchsian connection, which has only simple poles after the uh, collision of two simple poles, becomes more complicated connection with the second order pole. And in such, um, in such a way, you may uh, consider more complicated compactifications, but it's not for the uh, Riemann moduli space, but I would say that you have a, some kind of uh, moduli space of the RAM, X moduli space of uh, your base curve, and then you can compactify this thing by allowing connection to have uh, second order, third order, whatever order poles. Okay, and uh, why do we know this? Because we know the uh, uh, that there is a whole uh, family of the final equation. So I already told you that when you start with a um, uh, four-hole sphere and you consider SL2 uh, isomonodromic deformation, you obtain that Schlesinger equations. So again, you fix these points to be one, zero, one, infinity, and you have one moduli T. So you have only one equation in one parameter, uh, in one uh, deformation parameter, then you obtain a uh, finally V6 equation. Uh, but since finally V, we know that there is a limit of finally V equation 
uh, of six Fine Levy equation, which is Fine Levy five equation. And uh, this equation may be also uh, be considered as a isomonodromic condition, but now you consider uh, three whole sphere, I mean, three punctured sphere, I would say. Okay, so when I draw holes, it means puncture, whatever. Uh, but the connection has second order pole at one of the punctures. And then you have the whole coalescence cascade. So what you do actually is uh, it's so called uh, chewing gum moves introduced by Chekhov, Matsoka, and Rubtsov. And you just, the rule is that when you take two simple poles and you collide them, you draw another uh, circle like boundary, but the number of cusps will be two when you collide uh, two points. You may think that you just kind of uh, tear it in such a way. So let me just draw it and then uh, we can discuss it. So uh, <laughs> another option is that you have. Uh, these two points colliding, right? Uh, another thing is that you may take this point and send it to this point, and then you will have a bit more cusps uh, at your boundary. Okay, and uh, then uh, we may collide these two points, and then the number of cusps will be like four from here and another two from the tearing, this Riemann surface. And uh, what you will get is that you have six cusps, one, two, three, five, six. Yeah, and well, and uh, for, for each of this uh, kind of uh, schematical Riemann surface, you have the isomonodromic problems, uh, which corresponds to the uh, explicit equation. So it's uh, so-called finally V4, this is finally V3, and this is finally V1. Oh, finally, with two, and then you have also a set of equations which I will let let's discuss it maybe during the discussion, but not now. And uh, from the point of view of connection, it means that uh, you have a second order pole here, right? And this cusps, and when you have a second order pole, you have not only monodromy around the uh, puncture, but also your solution exists usually in the uh, sectors around the point. So if you will uh, just do it analytically, so imagine that this is second order pole, then uh, there are two rays which are called Stokes rays and you have uh, two sectors uh, which are intersect and it, at each sector you have unique solution which is defined by asymptotical um, behavior of your solution but when you pass from one sector to another so for example here you cannot have two uh, sets of fundamental solutions they should be connected by some matrix so imagine that here you have psi one as a fundamental solution here you have psi two as a fundamental solution but since these sectors intersect they should be connected by some linear transformation and this linear transformation is called stokes matrix it has some properties like uh, it uh, should be upper triangular or lower triangular. It should have identities on the uh, diagonal. I mean, this is a quite uh, analytical theory of differential equations. I mean, I have no time to explain it, but the fact is that when you have such cusps, it means that um, you obtain some additional data at your puncture and it transforms to some uh, new uh, data of, uh, so on the Betty moduli space, also, for, for, in this situation, you should also consider not only monodromies around the punctures, but you should also consider Stokes matrices. As far as I understand, that's what uh, Philip Bolch called well character varieties. And, uh, well, in a sense, this is something the same as the uh, uh, situation with uh, Betty moduli space. But now, instead of considering, uh, considering home from the fundamental group, you take a fundamental groupoid. Uh, I actually forgot how to name it. So let me call it fundamental uh, groupoid. So you allow, uh, so you consider obviously the, uh, 
uh, loops around the punctures, but also you may consider uh, the arcs, which starts at some cusp and may end at the same cusp or may end at different cusp. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, and you consider now such fundamental groupoid, you consider the maps from this groupoid to your group G and your quotient by G, and that's what we call a uh, wild uh, character variety or Betsy moduli space for irregular connections. But in principle, this is the same. You just consider the set of matrices. Some of matrices are of some uh, prescribed form, like Stokes matrices, they are upper or lower triangular, and then you consider the um, uh, cyclic relation, right? So it's mostly the same. Uh, okay, uh, so, yes? Yes. My question is, what can we do to you? What will happen in this case? When points when the points collide, then they, they go to infinity or they become more uh, 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 communities uh, and they start to move? Uh, uh, so uh, when you approach the boundary, actually, uh, you, uh, yeah, so um, you may obtain the limits of these equations. They will not become, um, um, so maybe I should do a statement now. And then we, we so yes, yes, I am going to discuss this thing. Uh, any questions regarding this? I mean, I'm just explained that how, how, what, what, yes? Yeah, I'm not sure if not be a good time to talk about it. So the picture that you have here, I mean, whenever you have two poles that are colliding, you basically replace a pair of poles with a single pole with the appropriate number of points. Yes. Um, and yeah, basically what's happening in this picture is you're considering different combinatorics of how two parts may collide. Sorry, how um, two poles may collide and how the cups kind of move together. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I will think about that when that picture is uh, Yeah, so uh, just, just let me try to explain you again. I will redraw it uh, in a minute. So uh, before, uh, so since we started, so when we had only just just like uncasped boundaries, right? It means that we have a simple pole here. So you may think that your connection locally uh, looks like this: lambda minus, for example, one plus b uh, lambda minus t, right? And then uh, when I do this coalescence, what I want is that uh, actually I don't want them collide and create a simple pole again. I want them to collide and create a second order pole. So you will obtain some new matrices. Let me call it A1 lambda minus one square, for example, plus, well, actually, let me call them U and V lambda minus U. For example, let's say that V goes to U plus A0 lambda minus U. Okay. This is a coordinate on our uh, base curve. Okay. Right, so you took two punctures, uh, abstractly U and V, then you tell me that V goes to you, right? But you don't want them just to collide, like, you know, just to obtain the N minus one moduli space, but you want some extra data and you do this limit such that you obtain the second order pole uh, for your connection, right? But then if you write the solution locally for such connection, what you get is that solution. So you have some differential equation, right? Which locally, uh, no, 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 two linear equation, okay? Something happens with these equations. I don't care about it for a while, right? So we started with some uh, linear differential equation, set of linear differential equations, okay? Flat connection, okay? And then uh, locally, my connection looks like this after the confluence, right? 
And if you will write down the local solution here, so uh, what, what happens when you had simple poll, your solution was like some series multiplied by the uh, exponential of some diagonal matrices, matrix multiplied by, uh, so, so in this case, for example, local solution is some series, maybe some matrix P plus O of lambda minus U multiplied by lambda minus U in power of lambda I, where lambda I is a Jordan form of matrix A. Yeah, this is just a, uh, well, how, how do we solve locally differential equations with Fuchsian singularity? But here uh, you have that, again, you have some matrix P, you have some series, which is uh, convergent uh, O of lambda minus U. But now, because of the second order pole, you have that your solution is actually, uh, you have some diagonal matrix lambda two, lambda minus U here, plus lambda one, logarithm lambda minus U. So this piece is the same as this piece mostly, right? But this piece uh, comes from the fact that you have second order pole, okay? And you know where, where you, uh, for example, consider a equation, you always uh, look for a dominant and subdominant solution. And it happens that when you have such solution, the you can prove the um, theorem of uniqueness in existence uh, using the, so instead of Cauchy data, now I want to use, for example, this asymptotical behavior of the solution, right? And then I want to ask myself, okay, uh, is it unique? Is it exist? Well, it exists, okay. But is it unique? And when I do prove uh, such theorem, the thing is that I may prove it only in some uh, sector around my point, okay? And, uh, but on the other hand, uh, doing some transformation, right? Changing from dominant solution to subdominant solution, I can prove that there, is, there exists uh, another solution, which is given by the asymptotic, but in other region. But I cannot have two fundamental solutions, right? Fundamental set of solutions. So that's why they should be, so let's say they Psi one and Psi two, they should be connected by the Stokes matrix, okay? And the number of overlaps gives you the number of Stokes matrix, okay? Right, so what you should believe is locally, what you say, what the of the yes, 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 yes. Right. Yes, this is the pole, right. This is point U. And you have the sectors. All right? Yeah. Yeah, so, well, since we started to, 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 to discuss it, so uh, returning to this picture, what was known before? Uh, so for Fuchsian systems was known a lot. I mean, these equations actually, you can write them. Uh, so again, since the eigenvalues are the constants of motion, the next uh, logical step is to say, well, maybe these equations are written on the coadjoint orbits of my algebra. And uh, you will see that actually, yes, and they are Hamiltonian. So you take the uh, Lee Poisson bracket for dual algebra, for example, or constant Kirillov serious form, if you reduce, and you will see that this equation might be written as a, uh, Hamil uh, as a Hamiltonian system with the following uh, Hamiltonian functions. So you take traces of the uh, products, G is not I, ui minus uj so you have uh, a lot of times you have a set of hamiltonians they commute they uh, they are non autonomous hamiltonians because they explicitly depend on time and they compute as a non autonomous hamiltonians which means that uh, hi and hj so in for the classical integrable system you will have that uh, the Poisson bracket should be zero and you can easily check that it, it is the case, but also for non-autonomous system, you should have a cross uh, derivative here. And it also happens. So in a sense, uh, well, for example, if you quantize it, you will obtain flat connection, which is called nizhnik zamalochikov connection. But let's just forget about it. 
okay so 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 uh you see that uh, when we start with the books and connection we just uh, the the only information we have is that uh you have the number of poles you have your lee algebra you have your lee group and then you automatically write this uh hamiltonian you write the uh, simplectic structure or lee poisson structure if you want on an reduced space and you know a lot about the uh, deformation parameters what about these cases for example for finally v5 finally v4 and so on what i found is that most of the cases are written explicitly so instead of writing down the general connection writing down the Poisson structure and um uh what are the deformation parameters we have some explicit examples written in darbo coordinates already so locally and no information about how to deal with the higher order poles and so on here i should um uh i think i should say a few names uh first of all there is a paper by john harnad uh who uh used the um uh, who used the um, um air matrix structure on the loop algebra and uh wrote some uh wrote all these examples as a um as a reduction with this so so he, he considered a little bit bigger space than just two-dimensional uh darbo coordinate but still uh, not the uh not for any algebra just for sl2 and just for uh, the cases which comes from the four hole sphere uh also philip bolch uh, investigating the non-abelian hodge correspondence uh claimed some uh, not claimed but also proved some uh, theorem about the phase space like in the case of hooks and connections you should consider the uh, direct product of coagent orbit philip bolch introduced uh some uh some more complicated orbit and uh, more compl complicated the algebras and stated that the model space of the ram is isomorphic to the direct product of these orbits if you will uh, forget about stability condition but then you just pick the right orbit when you so, so stability condition pick the right orbit uh when you do this thing uh uh yes matrices a uh, yes yes you start with uh, yes uh uh yes let me state it clearly so you start with some uh uh, you start with some uh bundle uh with Lee group G, right? Uh over sigma O N. Uh, then you consider isomonodromic deformation. So you consider deformation of connection. So you have set of matrices. Uh and each matrix in the uh Lee algebra of this uh group okay uh here i assume that uh, we work with the uh, algebras with non-degenerate bilinear form so i can associate the algebras uh, with the uh, dual algebra and the thing is that these equations yes they 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 uh are, this this flows are along the coagent orbit uh and you can write uh this system as a so so you take the uh, now you switch to the coin joint orbits okay uh quotient also by the action of the group then you have some symplectic form on this uh think you, you do symplectic quotient uh and this is the phase space for this system and this is the hamiltonian instead of trace you may take uh, it's just bilinear form So yes, let me summarize and make a statement. Yeah. So the point is that the the symplectic manifold, or we're describing this thing as a Hamiltonian flow. 
Yeah. It's, it's happening with a link instrument to control. Right? Yeah, yeah. So there, there's a there's a sequence. I mean, there's, there's a, a bunch of coordinate orbits associated with the poles. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Poles are ordered. They're labeled by integers from one to n. Yes, yes, yes. Each one of them has a coordinate orbit. Yes. You put them together to get a symplectic manifold. The symplectic manifold is describing the connection. That's what it's describing. Yes, yes. Now, yes. there's also another parameter, which is the, the configuration of the n, the positions of the n point. Right. And that's your modular space uh, uh, m, I'm not sure where it is. Yeah, right. And so the, and, and then you're taking the product of uh, this symplectic reduction, which is a symplectic manifold, the mm -hmm. product of that is m0 n. Yes. So that product is, is parameterizing all possible curves plus a choice of connection on that curve. Roughly speaking, of course, you need, you need to be careful because the, it's not a non trivial bundle. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's just roughly speaking, you have the moduli of curves cross the symplectic manifold of connection. Right. And so the whole thing is plus on. Uh, the symplectic manifold is just a manifold. Yes. So it's plus on. And then you're defining functions. Uh, how many? Uh, the uh, yes, the number of, the, the the number of function is the dimension of the modular space. Hopefully, it's well. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so some of have, them are trivial. Mm -hmm. Right, and so you have these these functions on this functional manifold, and they all cross onto me. Mm -hmm. when, when you look at the flow of these functions, they, 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 they give you trajectories. Right. Uh, which, which could be. So there are actually fewer functions. So it's a great degree of the five functions of the third It's not half if you consider the. Um, so it's half when you uh, consider the uh, rank one Lie algebras, right? But when you consider the rank n Lie algebras, you have the number of functions. So you have this non-autonomous functions, but then you consider some other um, invariant function. So you just consider traces of polynomials in this, uh, and, and they will commute. Uh, okay. So you may write the spectral curve and consider some 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 of the uh, coefficients of a spectral curve will give you Hamiltonian. Some coefficients will give you just first integrals. So when you consider rank n uh, vector bundle, you will have additionally just autonomous first integrals here. But it's better to think about rank one than, than everything you know. But it, it it still works for rank n. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you may pa so 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 well. Uh, so you can do the following trick. So you can not you can consider uh, the uh, non-reduced space, right? You have a, just a Poisson manifold, right? With some uh, with. Yes, 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 yes. But then you 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 quantize it by sending G star. Just uh, how you quantize the Lie Poisson structure, you just consider uh, the universal uh, enveloping algebra, right? Because uh, Lie Poisson structure, Lie Poisson. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Right. Actually, it's mean, um, two, two equations on, on the right hand side. It's the A equation and the H equation. The H equation, the H equation implies the A equation. Right? But the A equation is the is a zero curve, is the curvature of a of a connection on the product of a curve with a modular right? And it's just it's just uh, uh, encoding the fact that the Yes, but th th this is equation. It, it looks like a flat connection, right? Yeah. Right. 
I mean, you, it, it's not a commutator, right? It's just a Poisson bracket, right? But if, for example, you quantize, you usually switch from Poisson bracket to commutator of operators. That's what I'm saying, yes? So, so, so you can just do a naive uh, Dirac quantization of the Lie algebra, right? And this will be just a representation of universal developing algebra. And there will, where you get the flat connection. This thing will transform to a permutation matrix if you, for example, consider GL2 or SL2, right? At GL2. And this is a Knizhnik Zamolochikov system, if, if you're familiar with it. But, but yeah, I mean, this definitely means that there is some kind of integrability condition, but since it's non-autonomous system, it's not um, the same as in autonomous integrable system when you just take the levels of Hamiltonians and that gives you a Arnold Liouville Tori, right? Uh, but here, your uh, Hamiltonians, you cannot set the level because they explicitly depend on time, right? Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, and Yes, in this yes. And, and that is somehow we could be expressed as a class connection because yeah, clearly you're going to have a civilization given by the uh, yeah. So we mentioned this. Yeah, but the so viewpoint is I have this quantum manifold and I have this bunch of Hamiltonians and I can try to use them as such and then define some kind of flow. And that is what they the is the that is the Yes, 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 absolutely. So, well, uh, speaking, uh, uh, so, so uh, uh, to make a long story short, we have an isomonodromic deformations, right? Uh, they are some nonlinear equations. These equations may be seen as a uh, some nonlinear connection uh, in the uh, vibration of the over the moduli space. Yeah, and each fiber is a Deram moduli space of your curve uh, at fixed points, right? And this, uh, and you can associate uh, in the case of the Fuchsian connection, this thing with the uh, Hamiltonian system, with such Hamiltonians, right? They give this dynamic and the Poisson bracket or symplectic structure you take from the direct product of coadjoint orbits, right? Oh, sorry, dual algebras, if, you, if you're more happy with Poisson situation, right? Uh, or you can do the reduction. Firstly, you fix the Casimirs, of your Lee Poisson bracket, and then you also uh, do this uh, symplectic quotient with respect to Lee group. Okay, so this symplectic quotient just means that the sum of residues on the Riemann sphere equals to zero, right? Cauchy theorem written in the uh, in the symplectic reduction form. Uh, can I, may I continue? Okay. Okay, just continue, just continue. <laughs> okay, right. So uh, let me just write this table and just uh, basically tell you the uh, statement about the irregular connection that we have taken. So again, uh, we have regular, irregular. So now I allow uh, poles to be not only first order, but second order. We already discussed it. Firstly, uh, uh, phase space 
uh, it was known, and this is a direct product of the coagent orbits we already discussed. Uh, for regular irregular case, it was, well, we rediscovered this, but it was found by Philip Bolch. It was independently found by Yuri Chernyakov, who was uh, considering not isomonodromic deformation, but he considered the so-called Gaden systems, which are just integrable system. You can think that you forget that these letters are times, and you just switch here to TJ, and then you can consider the same procedure of colliding points. But what he obtained is that uh, how, how to write down the phase space. Uh, now, uh, Hamiltonians was known, was not clear. Some explicit examples were, were, were known before, but not the thing. Uh, well, let me say Betty moduli space. So this is just a character varieties. Uh, well, I don't know by who. I think Fricke was the first who wrote this cubic for four hole sphere. sphere. Uh, uh, and uh, for irregular connection, so concept by Bolch is wild character variety. Uh, concept by uh, Chekhov, Rubtsov, Matsoka, uh, this uh, uh, CASP uh, Riemann surfaces. Uh, also, I should say that uh, Igor Kinshiver uh, also considered this problem, and he was doing this, uh, doing this using some uh, what, what he called what, what he calls uh, universal uh, symplectic form. And uh, his approach allowed him to compute different things like dimensions like uh, symplectic structure in some cases and so so, so on and the, the last thing uh, which is I think quite important and today I wanted to um, uh, highlight it uh, deformation parameters and in the case of the regular connection you take your base curve and you take a moduli space of base curve but in the irregular connection, it wasn't absolute. It, it, it was a mystery. I mean, if you take the uh, uh, isomonodromic problems for Pineville equations, you can see explicitly where the time is. It's written in the connection explicitly, but the meaning of this thing was, I mean, some kind of parameter. It worked. That's that's the only explanation I had. And the thing is that. What we resolved, okay, so some of the results were uh, just rediscovered like this one. This one was, I mean, I, I didn't work on that too much. Uh, we found some explicit formula for Hamiltonians. Uh, and we found some very special, uh, uh, very special family of deformation parameters. Why, should, why do I say very special family? Because uh, Jimba Miva and Uyena, they also considered irregular isomonodromic deformations, but for the deformation parameters, they considered the uh, set of Birkhoff invariants. The problem is that uh, the deformation uh, along this Birkhoff invariants. Uh, so let me just uh, briefly explain this. So in this situation, you can also write down the phase space as the coadjoint orbits. But the flows which were introduced by Jim, Jim Bamiva and Uyena they are not along this coadjoint orbits. So they have a very big uh, number of times for each connections, deformation parameters, and they have some uh, reasonable explanation why we should take them. Uh, but uh, then the assumption that phase space may be written as a some coadjoint orbit uh, breaks. And uh, instead of using Jimba Miva, uh, Uyena times, what we did is that actually we consider explicitly the, um, firstly, we consider explicitly the limits for the connection, see what happens with times, obtain some formulas, and then we realize them as some uh, very special and interesting geometric object. Uh, I would say uh, some, some, some strangely, uh, I would say quite funny moduli space. Okay. Uh, so, now I just will state 
the theorem without proving them. I think this was the most of my talk <laughs> already. Uh, so firstly, what about phase space? Imagine that you have a connection which has, uh, so now for each pole, you have some poles from one to N and each pole have order Ri plus one. So it's uh, Ai, J, uh, sorry, J from zero, uh, lambda minus U, Ui, in power of R uh, of of G plus one D lambda. So I sum over the uh, uh, punctures and I sum over the uh, local expansions. Uh, so uh, local linear, for example, let's say that zero is one of the singularities. I have that uh, lambda in power of uh, R plus one uh, A R plus a r minus one lambda r plus and so on a zero divided by lambda so you are familiar with the indices right so so th this this thing called uh uh one career rank and usually we use it to calculate the number of stokes race so usually in for for a generic connection uh which mostly means that the leading term is semi-simple the number of Stokes sectors and Stokes matrices will be two multiplied by R. Okay, this is just an information. So statement is that uh, the space of such connections, uh, if you will uh, forget about stability conditions, is the following thing. So you take the quadrant orbits of the algebra, so we have, uh, R1, R2, R3, uh, Rn. Uh, so each of this matrix in some Lie algebra G and this coadjoint orbits are the coadjoint orbits of the uh, following al algebra. So take this first one, uh, O of R1. You take your Lie algebra, you consider the space of the positive loops just stay more serious with the coefficients in your Lie algebra. Then you quotient it by the following Lie algebra ideal. Mm. Yes, uh, I think plus one. So this is a Lie algebra, right? So you take the commutator from your initial Lie algebra and then you just uh, lift it up linearly with respect to Z, okay? So let me just uh, maybe uh, briefly write it down. So uh, so uh, you have some uh, polynomials uh, with coefficients in your Lie algebra. So you have A0 plus A1Z plus A2Z squared. Uh, and so on, a n z in power of n, and when you commute it with another element of your Lie algebra, b zero plus so on, b n z n, uh, n equals to r one. Then you just uh, well, you just uh, think that these are the uh, scalar elements, right? So what you will get is that uh, a zero with b zero plus Z A1 with B0 plus uh, A0 with B1 and so on, right? So these are truncated loop algebras also known as the Takif algebras. And these are definitely finite dimensionally algebra. The dimension of the uh, such algebra is just uh, R, uh, R plus one multiplied by the dimension of your initial algebra. And you can easily, it's a quite a simple exercise, how to write the uh, Lie Poisson structure, starting from Lie Poisson, Poisson structure on your initial Lie algebra, how to write the Lie Poisson structure on this uh, dual algebra, and so on. I mean, this is finite dimensional Lie algebra, so constant Kirillov serial theory works, everything is fine. Uh, 
so what it, it it's i mean it's in bold paper also that uh you can associate the space of your connection to this thing so you see that when you have a higher order pole everything a bit grows i mean the orbit grows and uh returning back uh maybe to Yes, yes, you take such algebra uh, with R1 here. Uh, then you take it uh, dually algebra, and then you take quadrant order. Yes, yes, yes. So if you have these coefficients, for example, AR, AR minus one, A0, they are just elements of the... So uh, I think it, it, it's a bit clear. Uh, it, it may be not clear. So if I take the space of uh, such uh polynomials with coefficients in your Lie algebra and do the commutator uh which also should be truncated at z in power of n plus one sorry r plus one right uh you may associate your dual algebra with the space of Laurent polynomials right and the parent will be just so imagine that uh now uh you have sorry for this uh, cross notation because now I want to. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, right. Is it clear how the Poisson bracket on the dual algebra works in this situation? Yes. 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 So, so this this are not the time. Right, right, right. So first, I start with the fact that, that this is this are uh, the um... yes, that's true, that's true. And we have some Poisson structure. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. That's true. That's true. So now let's let me uh, state something about the times. So uh, well, here I wrote it a bit uh, sloppy, and but if you will do some, uh, let me do some exercise in front of you, and maybe it will make it clear. So imagine that I have two points. Uh, 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 U and point uh, lambda minus W. Uh, and let me say that uh, W tends to uh, U. So what I want is to write down, uh, w, uh, sorry, not W, but V as U plus epsilon T1. So I just want to uh, control the speed. Uh, of my limit and then uh, I just take the limit epsilon goes to one so what I want to have is that uh, after this limit my letters uh, a1 and a2 so somehow transforms uh, and I want to obtain the second order pole if I will do it very carefully what I will obtain is that I will have some pole of order one with some matrix I call a0 uh, well, let me do it by hands. So uh, uh, A2 divided by lambda minus W, and here I have minus U plus epsilon T1. Uh, how, how should I uh, compute the limit epsilon goes to zero? So I have non-trivial second order uh, pole. Uh, I, just, uh, I just do a Taylor expansion with respect to epsilon, yes? And I want to keep the first order. So what I obtain is that actually this thing equals to A2 divided by lambda minus U, nothing new, right? Plus um, uh, epsilon T1, uh, A2, lambda minus U squared plus O of epsilon squared. I don't care about this part too much because what I want to keep is only this thing, right? And uh, I still have this 
time here. So imagine that I uh, found some uh, expansion for A1 and A2 in uh, letter epsilon, epsilon such that uh, I have a second order pole. What should I obtain is I uh, get the following thing. So lambda minus u squared plus uh, A0 lambda minus u. And this A1 and A0 are uh, so A1 is limit of epsilon uh, A1 or its limit of minus epsilon uh, A2. Mm -hmm. And A0 is a limit of a sum uh, A1 plus A2. Okay, so if you will compute this limit, you will see that your expansion in epsilon should start with uh, the power one over epsilon. And then if you will input this in the Poisson bracket, initial Poisson bracket for the V algebra, you will obtain this Poisson bracket. This is nothing uh, surprising happened. But what about this time T1? Can it say us something? Well, actually, yes. So imagine that I have a, a uh, Poisson algebra for letters A0 and A1. If I will compute this Poisson algebra explicitly, what I have is that actually uh, A0 with itself gives me the, uh, if this is a split Casimir in the algebra, no. You mean this one? Okay. Uh, this one's no. I assume that they have a uh, finite limit when they go to zero. Yes. Yes, but uh, you have the equality of uh, limits, not the whole uh, function. Uh, no, no, it's function of epsilon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, 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 look. <laughs> Okay, uh, so <laughs> let me just uh, rewrite it. So uh, you see that uh, if I want to have here finite limit, non-zero limit. Uh, this one? No, no, no. I, I, I have something. So if I, uh, okay. So finally, I want to have that the sum has finite limit, right? So, and I want to keep this one, right? So I say that A2 should start with one over epsilon, right? Uh, A2 plus something, okay? Plus some series. Yes, 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 yes. non zero limit exists. But then I start with the thing that uh, this thing may blow up, right? Because if it starts with one over epsilon here, then this thing blows up. But since I want to calculate the limit of the sum, I have A1 plus A2 here, right? Because this thing was over lambda minus U, right? Nothing changes here. It's locally constant. And this thing expands such that it has contribution to the first order pole and to second order pole. Yes. And since uh, A2 starts with one over epsilon, right? And I want this thing to be finite when epsilon goes to zero. I want that the, uh, well, let's say epsilon multiplied by this thing. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry. So singular term should, should cancel. So A1 uh, should start with minus uh, one over epsilon A2, okay? A plus extra stuff, right. The thing is that uh, in principle, you before you had a Poisson uh, structure on these two letters, right? A1 and A2. Then you expand them into series in a small parameter. You never construct unique Poisson uh, structure 
on the coefficients because it's it will be kind of infinite dimensional thing yeah uh and you may have a lot of different Poisson structures on the coefficients of your expansion which give you the right Poisson structure on the function itself right but the funny thing is that the only thing which uh survives after the limit in the connection in this infinite dimensional Poisson algebra forms the finite dimensional Poisson subalgebra and this subalgebra coincides with this dual Lie algebra uh, to this to this truncated thing, right? Uh, just uh, and and as a part of this computation, we obtain that there is also one parameter which enters um, which enters connection after the limit. This parameter was uh, measuring the kind of it's like you know. Of course, epsilon goes to zero, so we don't care about the modulus of T1. But for example, we may think that T1 is a complex parameter, right? And you can, for example, uh, by T1, uh, by T1, you can uh, change the angle of your limit, right? You may go around, for example, and then take a limit. Something happens, right? And it enters the connection, right? And now I want to understand, is there any kind of geometrical meaning of this parameter or not? And to do this, just let me first consider the Poisson algebra obtained. So this was the initial Poisson algebra in a sense, right? Uh, if you will switch to these two letters, you will get the same Poisson algebra for them. So this is just a Lie Poisson bracket written in the Leningrad notation, in the tensor notation, okay? Uh, and the Poisson algebra, uh, the rest of the Poisson algebra is of the following. So A1, commutes with a1 because they are top terms right so in Lie algebra they will commute right the top terms because z multiplied by z will be z square and they this should go to zero but uh a0 acts on a1 in a sense um invariantly okay so A0 with A1 gives you a kind of shifted Lie Poisson bracket, right? What happens if I will, instead of such algebra, consider the following algebra, just multiply by a scalar, which is central to my Poisson bracket. And we'll call this thing B1, and this will be B0. B0 just equals to A0, B1 equals to A1 multiplied by T. You will get the same Poisson bracket between B0 and B1 by means that I just uh, change the letters here, right? And if, well, I mean, yeah, if T, T is not zero, then it works, right? And what we obtain, if we will do the coalescence of a lot of poles, you will see that this new parameter so then when you for example decided to add one more point lambda minus w now the new parameters which uh, uh which appears in the connection after limit not only the speed but also uh you should control now the uh acceleration thank you <laughs> yes uh, and then T2 also enters connection. And what you obtain is that actually the uh, way how these letters combines in your connection provides you some Poisson automorphism of your algebra. So if you will take your uh, coefficients and just uh, name them B0, B1, B2, the Poisson algebra will be the same. Let me just write you an example of the third order, order pole. So what you will get is Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Right, right, right. So, so it's only about the connection and the Lie algebra data. Uh, and uh, well, if you will 
do the same exercise again. So you will, for example, consider second order poll in that form, and you will, uh, and you wish to send another poll to the second order poll and create the third order poll. You just consider such uh, uh, expansion for uh, another puncture, right? The third puncture, and if you will do the same thing. So what, what you what you care about is that uh, something is non-zero, then something is not blow up. So that's how you obtain the coefficients of your expansion in epsilon. You will obtain that your connection will be something like this. So A2 divided by lambda minus U in power of three. So the third order pole multiplied by T1 square plus uh, A1 T1 plus A2 T2 lambda minus U square plus A0 divided by lambda minus U. The Poisson bracket between uh, these letters is of the following form. So I, AI tensor AJ is the split Casimir of your initial Lie algebra with AI plus J. And Z, uh, if I plus J smaller or equal to two or zero when I plus J more than two, okay? But then if you will consider such linear combinations, they will have the same Poisson bracket. So I mean, if this is B2, this is B1, this is B0, okay? What it tells to us, uh, let me use that board finally. Uh, uh, it tells that when we consider irregular connections, irregular isomonodromic deformations, which appears as a limit of the Schlesinger isomonodromic deformations, uh, your deformation parameters, they kind of, uh, mm, they, they, these are some special linear Poisson optomorphism of the Lie algebras, uh, which you use to describe the moduli space, right? So, I mean, I, I choose any of such uh, T1, T2 uh, to be a numbers, and I obtain the same Poisson algebra as before. I switch these numbers, I obtain the same Poisson algebras on the space of the coefficients, right? And uh, if you will think about it, looks like that uh, something is happening. Uh, what what is happening? Actually, when we send uh, so when we describe this as a the RAM moduli space, so we know that on the RAM moduli space we we have a standard uh, structure, which is called uh, uh, ITA board symplectic form. Or you can just consider the following R matrix. So imagine that you have two connection. Uh, so this is the matrix D. So you have connection D plus A of Z, DZ, sorry, lambda, D lambda. Then, uh, well, uh, what, the Poisson, what the Poisson structure, which gives you the idea about symplectic structure is the Padeev Taktajan Poisson structure. So you take this matrices, you take the Poisson structure, and here you have R matrix. So it's split at Casimir divided by lambda minus mu. And here you have A of lambda tensor one plus one tensor A of mu. Okay. If you, for example, uh, evaluate this thing for the Fuchsian connection, right? So if you will assume that A lambda is AI lambda minus UI, I runs from zero, uh, from one to N, then this Poisson structure will be the same as the uh, Lie Poisson structure on these letters, okay? For Lie algebra you choose. So this Poisson structure, uh, push forwards to the following Poisson structure. You have AI with AJ, delta IJ, uh, P with 
AI. So different residues compute. The same residue gives you Lie Poisson structure, okay? But this thing is independent of the choice of UIs, right? And in some sense, the model space of your base curve, the location of poles, you, you switch them, but Poisson bracket doesn't, right? And in a sense, you may think about uh, the moduli space of base curve as a moduli of Poisson representations of G star in power of N into um, mm, G of lambda. Right? Because, I mean, I insert somehow these poles, I insert somehow these residues, and I have that this is a Poisson morphism. I change a bit uh, the location of poles, it's still Poisson morphism, right? And what happens uh, when we switch to irregular connection? Uh, it happens that there is a non trivial moduli of the Poisson automorphism of the algebra. Here, I don't say about the coadjoint action because Lie Poisson bracket is invariant with respect to the coadjoint action, right? But you have some inner automorphism here. And in a sense, the moduli uh, the deformation parameters, they remember about this mantra that uh, if you take a connection, if you prescribe the uh, behavior at the poles, then isomonodromic parameters are the parameters which parameterize the moduli space of Poisson representations. But here you don't consider G star in power of n, but you consider G star of Z, uh, sorry, G of Z over Z R1 uh, plus one, G of Z dual and so on. So you just switch algebras to the truncated loop algebras, but logic remains the same. The deformation parameters, they don't change the Poisson structure on the uh, space of the connections. And uh, yeah, and this was the, <laughs> I would say, sorry, I spent a lot of time actually, uh, but uh, I, I hope I, I made it a bit more clear. So uh, now when you consider this irregular isomonodromic deformations, uh, it always has the same meaning like you uh, deform them along the moduli of Poisson representations. Uh, you can write it as a Hamiltonian flow on the coagent orbits of the corresponding D algebras. Um, I think now we may discuss it. And thank you for your attention. Sorry for being a bit Spontaneous. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like that the, the structure ignores everything. You just need to, so you can do collision, whatever this, this Poisson structure still works. Then, uh, yeah, I mean, yes. Uh, collision, it's, no, no, when, when it's already collided, the collision is not a kind of, uh-huh. 
Uh, I no, no. What I claim is that uh, the process of collision may be. I mean, I don't uh, collide them along the some solutions of the Pinder equation, but it may be the case. What I say is that after collision, you have a nice Poisson structure. You have a nice interpretation. Uh, you have a nice deformation parameters, um, and uh, the equation transforms trans transforms to uh, the Hamiltonian equations transforms to other Hamiltonian equations. Uh, yes, that, that right. These poles have locations in UI. Yes. And you put that UIs together with the real. Mm -hmm. You get a Hamiltonian description of isomorphism. Yes. So that remains within poles of the real. If you do an isomorphism flow, it stays within there. Yes. In, in that. Yes. So now you you let two orders of one pole collide in particular ways, right? So that it gives us a second order pole. Right. We investigated that with this Yes. And we discovered that the two times, namely the two positions of the poles, mm -hmm. which were U and V, the two positions. Yes. The U and V, they got combined into two other parameters. Yes. Or U and what we call T1. Right. Okay, so now you have U, you no longer have V, but you have T1. Mm -hmm. So now the U and T1 play the same role for the same picture as before, meaning we have like a Schlesinger, generalized Schlesinger system which stays within yes, the yes, poles yes. and which describes as a monogamy of second order poles. Yes, 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 indeed. indeed, and, indeed. and your result is that that is Hamiltonian. Uh, that is Hamiltonian, yes, and uh, the um, the dependence on on these parameters, right? This is the result. Uh, yes. Uh, one Hamiltonian. So so one you consider Hamiltonian as a function, right? A uh, function of the letters A here, for example, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. You have bundles over the components of the stuff. Yes, yes, yes. And you have separate bundles that you consider. One of the bifurcation diagram itself. Yes. The question is whether you can put it together in the common thing. So if I understand you correctly, uh, what you say is that, uh, well, I have some uh, space of uh, my U1 and U and V. I have some, uh, well, coalescence uh, locus, right? Uh, here I have Hamiltonian, uh, Hamiltonians, which describe the dynamics at each point, right? Well, firstly, firstly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I do a limit which sends me to this locus, right? And here I also have a Hamiltonian. The thing is that uh, in both cases, Hamiltonian uh, is a function on the phase space, so is a definitely is a function of a1, a2, and u and v, for example, right? Uh, yes. So if I had Hamiltonian, uh, so so this picture is how you should transform the connection under this limit. But also, computation says that uh, this Hamiltonian transfer to this Hamiltonian under this Galileo's uh, procedure, right? But the problem, uh, the biggest problem and uh, complicated thing is that when you speak about connection, this is a linear object, right? Well, I mean, it's quite, it's rather simple. When you speak about Hamiltonian, it trace of the product, so it's a quadratic um, object, and you obtain something of order one over epsilon square, but then you need to see that it becomes a Casimir in your uh, new Poisson algebra. So it's a, kind of a, it's a technical thing, but it's, it's a... Yes, 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 yes. And the Poisson bracket is also, it, it's like, I don't know. I think we need to maybe discuss. I think it's a smooth procedure, right? 
it's a smooth limiting procedure. It sends Hamiltonians to Hamiltonians, Poisson structure to Poisson structure. Um, yeah, uh, the question is that if you take solution of one Hamiltonian system and perform such limit, what will happen? I think it should be something like the solution goes to solution. But I don't know because it. Yes. Right, right, right. So, yeah, this is the case. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, you can actually, well, let me say this maybe this regarding the. Uh, This, because I think the word isomonodromic deformation may be a bit, you know, confusing. Uh, yeah, so uh, theorem states uh, very simple, for example, for, for uh, isomonodromic time. Imagine that you have a uh, number of letters, A N till A N, and you have some structure. Uh, uh, the bilinear structure uh, uh, well, AI with AJ equals to, uh, well, something. I will write the same structure I'm going to put here. But I mean, it, it's something that uh, the linear on the left hand side and gives the linear uh, function on the right hand side. Uh, then, uh, if you take this letter, A0, A1, AN, and consider the following linear transformation. So the letters B0, B1, you may ignore this center thing. BN equals to this uh, vector col uh, column vector uh, multiplied by the matrix of MN. This matrix is given by uh, the, the entries of this matrix are uh, the following. You take this MN by J, and, uh, and we have some polynomial okay. and then the um, each entry of this matrix is given by the following rule. So you take this polynomial, Pn, uh, take it is power, and then uh, you take the coefficients in front of the epsilon and power of j. That's how you obtain in the entry of this matrix, Mij. Okay. Since this is this polynomial is zero when epsilon goes to zero, well, this matrix will be upper triangular firstly. Right, and uh, I want to start with zero. So firstly, will be row one zero zero zero. Here you will have t one, t two, t n, and then you will have more complicated things. Right, some monomials, which are actually uh, arise from the expansion of the following function one over one minus p n of epsilon t. And uh, the statement is that uh, if you have such po such structure on letters A, you will have the same structure on letters B if you choose such transformation. So its 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 statement is independent of any isomonodromic deformations or something. There's some statement about the um, graded Poisson structures, linear Poisson structures, and th this is obviously not the uh, kind of Quadrant act action of the group. Right? So this is some kind of special, uh, special in this case Poisson morphism, but you can consider, I think, any bilinear structure, which is linear on the right hand side. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we should stop. But thank you very much for uh, taking this off. Thank you. Yeah. Well,
Боря. By the way, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. <laughs>